Nobody's here. God, I can't see. Wait, wait, what's the matter? That's it. You can get your jacket on now, Reg. You know, if you have another thrombosis, it could be in your brain and not your eye. And that would mean a stroke. But I can't go away for a month. Nobody's indispensable. I am. Especially with Mike away. <laughs> the trouble with you, apart from high blood pressure, is delusions of grandeur. Why don't you take Dora down to the seaside? What on earth would we do there? Rest. You need a complete rest or you're going to be seriously ill. Do you understand? I know. We'll go to London and visit Mike. No, you won't. He's probably enjoying his secondment to the Met. The last thing he wants is you showing up. He invited us. He's missing me. That's hard to believe. I know. We'll go to London for a week and then stay in a hotel in the country. Ah, now you're talking. Right, now I want you to take this down to the hospital with you and ask for Dr. Nichols. What's this? It's a diet sheet. A thousand calories a day. It sounds a lot, but believe me, it isn't. It's starvation. <laughs> My sister's house, everything in it tells me that I don't get on. I'm sorry about this. No, oh, it's not your fault. Hello, darling. Mike in? No, he rang in to say he was going to be late. Oh, well, I'll uh, just go into the sitting room and read. He said he'd be back about 6.30. Then we'll talk about the weather. I think I'd rather read. Utopia. Oh, that's nice. You forgot these. Oh, damn these childproof bottles. Well, I've been here four days and Mike hasn't spoken to me once about his work. I'm beginning to feel unwelcome. Don't be silly. You're on holiday. He doesn't want to bother you. 
What's for supper? Uh, some carrot and coriander soup, water biscuits, and half a grapefruit. Diet, remember? It's in Latin. Got uh, Ralph Robertson's translation of Thomas More's Utopia. It's a everyman classic. I'll just check. Thank you. of a girl was discovered yesterday in a vault at Kenbourne Vale Cemetery, West London. It was later identified as that of Miss Loveday Morgan, aged about 20, of Garmish Terrace, W15. The discovery was made by Mr Edwin Tripper of Kenbourne Lane, a cemetery attendant, when he went to give the vault its monthly inspection. Detective Mike Burden hmm. said this is definitely a case of foul play. I can say no more at present. <laughs> Could have come up with something more original, couldn't he? Oh, Mike Burden in print, eh? Can I have a look? <laughs> oh, let's see. Mr Tripper told me the vault is the property of the Montfort family, who were once important people in Kenbourne. It gave me a terrible shock. It was the last place you'd expect to find a corpse. Transport is an obvious example, and this affects visitors to a very great extent. I think that uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, we read all about it in the papers. He seems uh, that tubes uh, are inadequate, they lack the necessary investment. Uh, and it's hell's delight for coach parking. I'm really sorry for the coach operators. Thanks, Dora. Why did you have to invite them? I don't think they'd come. Mike, I'm on 
managed to get three weeks up here with you so we could spend some time yes, together. I will be gone on Friday. Don't you like Dora? I do. I bet you really isn't well. It's the least I can do. I know. Oh, no, please, don't turn it down. Mm. I like the shirt. Thank you. Jenny bought it. I thought you were going to be on the TV today. Me? Well, you were in the newspapers. Hot, isn't it? I thought it was going to be cooler today. I wish I could find time to read. Well, I think I'll turn in. You all right? Fine. Don't forget your book. How's the eye? Good night, Mike. That really is a lovely shirt, Mike. Morning. Oh, for God's sake, Dora. I can manage. Yes. Of course you can. The breakfast's ready. Thank you. This diet will be the death of me. Oh, it's not that bad. Imagine if you were a diabetic as well. Oh, who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty caucuses? Pills. I'll take them later. Where are you going for your walk this morning? I don't know yet. I wouldn't do it to you. He who asks questions is a fool. He who answers them is a greater fool. Read this. Pass on without comment.
Good God, Reg. I thought you wanted to take a holiday from all this sort of thing. Did you? Well, I can't imagine why. I won't keep you from your work. I've got to get back and help Dora pack. Reg, wait. If you want to see the vault, why didn't you say last night I'd have brought you with me this morning? If you want the inside stuff on the case, you only had to ask. Ask? Ask? When you've made a point of excluding me from everything to do with your work ever since I've been here. I know when I'm not wanted. Crocker gave me explicit instructions. Well, he had no right. Well, I must say, it seemed pretty ridiculous. I mean, it's hard enough to imagine you taking a break from work, but to come and stay with me and expect us not to even talk about it, it's been sheer torture. In fact, I really do need to talk to you about this one. Do you? Yes. Oh, this is your big one, Mike. I wouldn't want to ruin it for you. How can you be so arrogant? This is London, not King's Markham. We've hardly any men on the case. We need all the help we can get. At least come and talk about it over lunch. Right. photo we have of her. It's in the handbag we found with her body. When or where it was taken, we don't know. What'd she do for a living? She worked as a receptionist at a television rental place. Apparently, she went to work by taking a shortcut through the cemetery. Now, there was also a sheet of note paper in her handbag with two telephone numbers on it. You rang them, of course. Of course. It's one of the first things we did. One was a hotel in Bayswater. They told us that they'd advertised for a telephonist and Love Dead applied for the job. What did they say about her? They said she was shy and awkward. She didn't get the job. The other was a West End company called Notborn Properties, who were well known here and in Notting Hill. They'd advertised for a receptionist. Now, she'd got as far as an interview, but they didn't like her either. So, she wanted to change her job. Now, does anybody know why? More money, I should imagine. When and how did she die? Uh, probably last Friday, 36. She was strangled with her own silk scarf. Last Friday? And nobody reported her missing? Oh, they come and go where she lives. They don't ask questions. Well, what about boyfriends? As far as we know, she didn't have any. Um, the body was identified by a Mrs. Peggy Pope, who's the housekeeper at 112 Garmish Terrace, where Loveday lived. And she says that she had no friends at all. Apparently, she arrived there last January. No one knows where from. No previous address? Well, we checked the address that she gave to Mrs. Pope, but they'd never heard of her. So, we don't know where she came from, and we don't really know who she was. That was fast. Well, I was hungry. Well, don't stop. Last Friday, the 26th of June, she went to work as usual, returning to her flat as she sometimes did during her lunchtime break. Now, Mrs. Pope supposed that she'd gone back to work in the afternoon. But in fact, she telephoned the manager of Sight and Sound. Oh, that's where she worked? Yeah. She called to say that she was sick, and that's the last that anyone ever heard of her. She may have gone to the cemetery, she may not. The cemetery gates close at six each evening. And on that day, they closed at that time, as usual. Now, what about this woman who identified her, this, um, Peggy Pope? This is uh, Chief Inspector Wexford, an old colleague of mine, Sergeant Clements. Hello, sir. Shall we go in? Fine.
bit of very long. I've got to take the bags up if Johnny don't get back. Johnny? My friend that I live with, her dad. Makes himself scarce on bin day, lazy sod. Now, what do you want? Is there anything more you can tell us about Ludbear Morgan? She had a job, if that's what you mean. Though God knows how she kept it, she was so thick. Stupid, was she? Had to come to me for everything. I even had to show her how the phone worked. I mean, even you've got a pretty good idea how the phone works. She imposed on me a bit, you know. Actually, more than imposed. She had the nerve to try and get Johnny away from me. Really? Maybe you should tell us about that, Mrs Pope. Miss Pope? No. There was probably nothing in it. Just she was always coming down here to chat him up while I was out. What she got to talk about, I don't know. She was a right misery. What do you think she was so miserable about? I don't know. Maybe you should ask Johnny. Maybe we should. She was always asking if I had a cheaper room. I mean, you try and find a cheaper room than 50 quid a week in this part of London. Now, we'll have to talk quiet, if you don't mind. Tell us about last Friday, Mrs Pope. Miss Pope. When I want to be a missus, I'll find a man who can support me. Just tell us about last Friday. I don't know anything about last Friday. She came in about ten past one and went out again about ten to two. Oh, and she made a phone call. I don't know anything else. Miss Pope, could you tell us in as much detail as you can remember about that phone call? Please. It was just after one, maybe ten past. Johnny was in the pub. I was in the hall giving it a bit of a sweep when Love Day came in. She said hello or something. I said hello. Then she went straight upstairs. I was just getting out of the vacuum when she came down and asked if I've got change for a 50 pence piece. So I came down here and looked in my bag. But I'd only got one 10p bit, so I gave it her. Then she went to the payphone in the hall. That detailed enough? Do you have any idea who she might have been calling? No idea. I didn't hear what she said, Hoover and all. And what happened then? I told you, I went downstairs to check out the baby. And when I came up again, she was just going out through the front door, wearing her black suit. I noticed, because it was the only decent thing she had. She didn't say anything. Now, I've got to do the bins, OK? Yes, thank you, Mrs Pope. We'll be in touch to talk to Johnny. I'll give you a hand. You know, they should get somebody to do this for you. Yeah, you tell them. Yeah. Well, maybe I will. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Don't want to go lifting heavy things at your age, do you? Someday my prince will come. I hope so, Miss Pope. Where you got to? We've been to see a Mr. Teal. He was on the top floor. He's been here longest. Anything useful? He was out. Well, I think I found out where Love Day got a name from. Oh, yes. It's very possible. Here we are, Rish. You didn't forget to take the pills, did you? No, I didn't. I knew it was a mistake to come here. Well, that's not a very grateful attitude. Well, I thought we were going to see plays, and instead you're moping around like a seven-year-old. Well, you've been treating me like a sick child. You only need yourself to blame. Come on, you two now. Stop it. Hello. I'm sorry I'm late. 
Frau, I've had a word with Baker. And he's OK about you helping us out. OK? The detective I've been seconded to. You know that phone call that Loveday made from Garmish Terrace? Yes, that was a call to sight and sound. Uh, you said she rang them to say that she was sick. Exactly. But it turns out that that call was made at 2 o'clock, whereas the one that Miss Pope told us about was made at 1.15. So who did she call? Her mother, a relative. I don't think so. Uh, help. help yourself to vegetables. Whatever. That was the important call. The decisive one. That was the call to a killer. Possibly. I think I'll have a poke around tomorrow. But we leave tomorrow. Oh, Dora. I'm so sorry, I forgot. Um, my gas is to stay until Tuesday. I rang the hotel in the Cotswolds. It's, it's all right with them. Excuse me. Go straight to bed. What are you doing? The man's ill. He's meant to be resting. I'll make sure he rests. He wants to help. He was getting worse. You should have seen him today. He came to that place where Loveday's body was found. Mike, shut up. What about you and me? What about us? Remember? I believe you were friendly with the dead girl. Well, I don't know about friendly. Sort of knew her. You the police? Yeah. You called Johnny, aren't you? Johnny Lamont. Who else was she friendly with in the house? I don't really know. She said she didn't have any friends. She told you that, did she? Yeah. She only really spoke to me and Peggy. I, mean, I don't think anyone else could tell you anything. Anyway, they'll all be at work by now. Thank you. thought you'd show up sooner rather than later. Please, come this way. Thank you. Welcome to my humble abode. Very nice. We like it. There's a lovely view over the cemetery. Now, let me introduce you to Philip Chell, the other consenting adult in this establishment. Pleased to meet you. How do you do? I'll uh, get some coffee. You've no idea what a pleasure it is to say that openly to a policeman. No. Sit down. Oh. Well, tell me as much as you can about Luke Dane Morgan. Well, I only knew her very slightly. She was a strange, repressed child. She looked as though she'd been brought up by strict, old-fashioned parents. Once or twice, I saw her creeping off to church as if she was doing something both wrong and irresistible. Church? Yes, some people still go even in these enlightened times. Which church? The one up the street. They call themselves the Children of Revelation. They're rather like the Plymouth Brethren. There's about three of these chapels in London. <laughs> about a couple of years ago, one of them was had up for indecency, poor son. It was in all the papers. And did Loveday belong to this church? No, no, I doubt it. Uh, she used to work in a TV shop, and that wouldn't be allowed. No, she probably went there because it was the nearest church and she wanted a bit of comfort. I never talked about it with her. What did you discuss with her, Mr. Teal? Well, we only really talked once. Well, anything might help. 
About a month ago, I met Loveday coming along the lane, looking as if she'd come into a fortune. She was on her way back from work, and uh, she was almost laughing. You know, the way a child laughs from joy, and... Go on. Well, she seemed stunned when I asked her if she was all right, and she said she'd like to sit down. Anyway, the upshot of it was I took her into a pub and I brought her a brandy. Do you know, I don't think she'd ever been in a bar before. The colour came back to her cheeks when she started to drink, and I thought that she would open up. But she didn't. No. Instead, she began asking me about Johnny and Peggy Pope. Were they trustworthy? Did I think that Johnny would stay with Peggy? Well, I couldn't say. They've only been here about four months, not much longer than Loveday herself. And then she asked me, were they very poor? Well, that's a strange question. I mean, she couldn't have helped them financially. Certainly not. She hadn't any money, no. I imagine that Loveday was a bit in love with Johnny, but he wouldn't have looked at her. He's fiercely in love with that child. Oh, and that Peggy, she's stunningly beautiful, don't you think? In spite of all that dirt. So that's all you know, then? I'm afraid so. No friends or callers? I wouldn't know. There's no need to eavesdrop. I saw a girl we've loved her. Oh? When was that? Oh, I don't know. She came in a car, a uh, red golf. I was going out and she was talking to her on the corner by the church. Well, that's interesting. Have you any idea what they might have been talking about? I said hello, but she just ignored me. Well, describe the girl, Philip. Philip is a close observer who looks quite through the deeds of men. She's got short hair. She was wearing a sort of dark blue coat and gloves. Is that all? Yeah. She wore gloves. In summer. Not many people wear gloves in summer. A full and detailed portrait. Tatiana Alexandrovna Kratov. Oh, you know who she was, then? There's not much I don't know about this cemetery. Or Kembourne itself, for that matter. My company's doing up properties in this area. Unwritten history books in here. <laughs> you must be a stranger to these parts. Yes. This place is fascinating. Wouldn't agree with those people who want to tear it down there. Isn't there People that want to tear this place down? Oh, yes. Do you live here, then? I was born here. I love every inch of the place, but I live in Hampstead. Kembourne Vale wouldn't suit my wife, but it will one day when I've done with it. Not by any chance connected with not born properties, are you? The chairman, Stephen Dearborn. Oh, he <laughs> I suppose the murder has spoiled this place for you. In a way, yes. Yes, it has. Odd thing is, that very girl came to me for a job. I interviewed her myself. Putting her body in the vault seemed like a sort of desecration. Oh, why? I'm the trustee for the Montford estate. We look after the tomb. 
I suppose you're going to renovate all this as well? I want to show people what's really here. Hidden in the undergrowth. Elegant facades. Beautiful carvings. What did you say you did? Oh, well, I'm just on holiday. I could show you maps of this place as it was 150 years ago. I'm sure you'd be interested. What do you think? Well, I'd like that very much indeed, Mr. Dearboy. Well, why don't you drop around this evening? I'll give you the address. So much for summer. You cozy in there. Come on, I'm in. Had your lunch yet, sir? Uh, no, I was thinking of trying your canteen. Do you recommend it? I usually pop home if I can. I only live around the corner. And I like to see the boy when I get the chance. He's normally in bed by the time I get home at night. Your son? I hope so. You hope so? Well, we're trying to adopt him. Uh, he's been with us on three months probation. We're 99% there. Oh, it's all been done through the proper channels. But natural mothers have been known to change their minds at the last minute. And the courts always go with the mother, even if she's given her consent in writing. Do you know the mother? Uh, no, sir. She doesn't know us either. We're just a number to her. Well, I hope things go well with you. Thanks. Is that the shop where Love Day worked? Yeah, that's the one. Who's that by the van? That's Gregson, the youngest one there. He's the only one in need of an alibi. Gregson? Associated with love, though. The cemetery bloke saw him giving her a lift home one night. And one of the reps reckons he used to chat her up in the shop. Well, that's a bit said, isn't it? So was his alibi. But he reckons he was in the crown, not in the hill. That's a villain's pub. That's Baker. The inspector your inspector's on secondment to. Here, put him through the mill, all right. Tell him a thing or two, like his father should have done years ago. Has Gregson got a record, then? He's vicious. Like most of the young today. The younger bats are in that shop, and he gave her lifts in that van of his. We know he gave her eight. Well, we can't expect to find witnesses for every time they were together. They were the only young people in that shop, and you can't tell me that a girl like Morgan would not have encouraged his attentions. What about the motive? Morgan encouraged him, then gave him a cold shoulder. In the cemetery? Pardon? Do people make love in a cemetery? No doubt. You have a better suggestion. Well, I have some questions. I understand the cemetery closes at six. What was Gregson doing all afternoon? He was with a Mrs. Kirby in Copeland Avenue till about 1.30, then back at the shop. After that, he went to a house in Monmouth Street, and then he had a long repair job in Queen's Avenue that took him till about 5.30. Then on to the park, where he spent the rest of the evening with his mates. Then I don't see... But the cemetery closes at six o'clock. Does not mean people can't get in or out. There are breaches in the wall. Oh. Winston, you must admit you don't know this man. Eh? Do we have a medical report? We'll come to that in a minute. Gregson met her in Queens Avenue at 5:30. They went to a secluded spot in a cemetery. She became frightened, screamed, perhaps, so we strangled at the silence. Red spent this morning getting background on that day. Oh yeah, what did Red find out? She was a very innocent girl, very shy. Afraid to go to parties. Very likely she's only ever been to a pub once in her life. Oh, really? Now, would a girl like that lead a man on? Go with a comparative stranger to a lonely place? She'd be too frightened. Another thought that struck me, but I, I'm not sure. Oh, tell us. I was wondering why the murderer put her into the Montfort vault. Did he realise that it was inspected at the end of each month? Now, a boy like Gregson, he'd have put her somewhere else. Somewhere less calculated. I think the man who killed her knew what he was doing and put her in there, believing that she wouldn't be found for a few weeks. Mr. Wexford, you're a long way from home. I don't mean to be disrespectful, sir, but you just call Morgan shy and innocent. And I'm sure you know how deceptive appearances can be. Post-mortem findings, on the other end, are not deceptive. Would it surprise you to hear that, according to the medical report, she'd given birth to a child during the past year? Now you can see why I'm missing King's Markham. Well, 
If I had all this, I wouldn't miss Kings Markham. No, 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 I meant Baker. Ah, I know. He's right, you know, though. Yes. Actually, he has a reputation for being right. They say he's been going through a hard time recently. No, it amazes me. Absolutely amazes me. We know nothing about Loveday Morgan, and he's jumping to all these conclusions. Yes, I know. I wonder her family haven't come forward yet. Baker just seems to ignore that. To me, it's all important. Baker just wants to get the killer off the streets. That address that uh, Loveday gave Peggy Pope when she came here. Maybe I ought to go and ask around there. I mean, she must have had some reason for giving that address. Rich, I have to go. Um, use that phone. Anything else you want, just ask Clements. All right. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. What a lovely place. You'd agree with my wife, then. It's an improvement on Temple. Yeah. Even smells of the country. Coming. Thank you. Melanie's upstairs with our daughter. She wouldn't go to sleep, and it's no good me staying with her. I just want to cuddle her and play with her all the time. What will you drink? Well, do you have any beer? I like to drink from the can, but Melanie would give me hell if we did. So here. Thank you. That's a fine drinks cabinet. When Alexandra grows up, I'll fill it with sweets and ice cream. I've just turned 44. My wife says it's made me soppy. I'd like to get the moon and stars for my daughter. You're not afraid of spoiling her, then? I'm afraid of many things, Mr. Wexford. It's not easy being a parent. No, it isn't. It's a good thing people don't know that, otherwise they wouldn't dare have children. I could never feel like that. I've been a lucky man all my life, but I never discovered true happiness until I got Alexandra. If I lost her, I'd kill myself. Oh, come now, you mustn't say that. It's true, I mean it. You don't believe me. Hello. I'm Melanie. Reg Wexford. <laughs> I hope this doesn't prove too boring an evening for you. Oh, but as long as you don't encourage Stephen to cart us off to some slum, he gets tired of places he can't improve. Oh, I don't see how you can improve on this. Oh, thank you. Reg, come in here. Excuse me. Now, look at these. This is what Kenbourne Vale used to look like a hundred years ago. Look at this one of the cemetery. Here's another one. See here, the state of the walls on the eastern side is so bad. Vandals are getting in and plundering the place all the time. Oh, that'll be your taxi. Maybe this is enough for one night. Yes, perhaps I ought to be heading home. I'll tell him you're on your way. Thank you.
It's my daughter. Children are an anxiety these days. Yes, I suppose so. You never know what trouble they may be in. You must come again. Or better than that, I'll take you on a tour around some of the places we've talked about. Are you in London for long? Only till next Tuesday, and then we spend a week in a hotel in the Cotswolds. Lovely. And then back to work. What sort of work? Oh, I'm a policeman. How interesting. You're not an ordinary policeman, I'm sure. A detective chief inspector. Tuesday. Ah, well, that's put paid to the tour. You're going home and I've got an architect's convention in Yorkshire. Next time you come to London, maybe. Absolutely. And thank you very much for a lovely evening. Pleasure. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Are you all right? Yes. Good night. What's the matter now? Where are you going? Out. Out for a walk. I can't bear waiting like this. Where's my scarf, Stephen? Have you seen my blue silk scarf? No. No, dear, I haven't. Know who she was. Are you a friend come up with anything? I don't know. He's out today, looking round where she said she lived before she moved to Kimball. Sorry to disturb you. I wonder if you remember seeing this woman. You're the third person to call in the past few days. I told you all my daughter left a few months ago and she's living in Shepherd's Bush. I saw her last night and she wasn't dead then. Does that satisfy you? Yes. Thank you. Sorry to disturb you. We're checking the area to see if anybody remembers that woman. Not much of a photo, is it? She was a shy, timid girl, by all accounts. No, I don't remember seeing anyone like her around here. Sorry. No. Well, thank you very much. You. She'd been talking to Baker. There was a break in on a Friday night and an assault. We pulled in a suspect this morning, and the alibi he's given is being supplied by Harry Slade, the same person who supplied the alibi for Gregson. Well, that gives Baker another lever against Gregson. Have you managed to link him to the uh, phone call that Loveday made yet? No, not yet. Have a good weekend? Very pleasant, thank you. How's the boy? Oh, well, he's great, sir. You should hear the way he laughs. He's just started to crawl. I reckon he's going to walk before the year's out. What's his name? Uh, Joshua. But I'd like to change it to Fred. Fred? It's after my dad. Oh, quite right. By the way, once we've got the adoption order sorted out, we're going to have a proper Christmas. The uh, hearing's quite soon, isn't it? Yeah, next Monday. Sometimes I wish I'd just come to a private arrangement with the mother. What do you mean, by the child? Yeah. But that's against the law. Well, she could also keep the money and still oppose the adoption order. Exactly.
What is it? Nothing. What? Just a thought. I think they might be onto something. I might have something for you tomorrow before we leave. Reg? Well, I forgot a phone number here. I just popped it together. No, 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 no. I mean, what is going on? I mean, what is going on? Well, there's a woman's been phoning for you. Melanie something. I didn't catch the last name. And she said, could you go around and see her in the daytime, please, when her husband is out? Now, what is going on? Who is she, Reg? Melanie. Melanie. Oh, I'm having a red hot affair with her. No. No, no. I'm serious. Dora. Dora, look at me. Well, look at me. What woman in her right mind would want me? Oh, thank you very much. I would. Oh, the blindness of love. Thank you, Mr. Wexford. Thank you for coming so quickly. I was hoping you'll be able to give me some advice. Me? Oh, you're a detective, uh, but you're not exactly working at the moment, if you know what I mean. You can tell me what I ought to do. Well, maybe you should try and relax first. <sighs> it's my daughter. Alexandra? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean my older daughter, Louise. She's 21. Oh, please, sit down. Well, you don't look as if you could have a 21-year-old daughter, Mrs. Dearborn. You look far too young. Oh, she's not Stevens. I was married before. My first husband died when Louise was 10. Anyway, she's missing. She normally rings me every week, but for the past two weeks, there's been no call. Have you been to her address? Oh, she won't let me know where she lives. Some months ago, Stephen hired a private detective to track her down. The detective found her. She was furious. She moved on and promised to sever contact with me altogether if I ever tried to find her again. It wasn't my idea. It was Stephen's. Why doesn't she want you to know where she lives? I don't know. I think she resents me getting married again. I don't know. Does she have a job? No. She's never worked. She has an allowance. Oh, God, I'm so frightened. Well, maybe I could go to the last address you were given and uh, try to find out where she's moved to. But if she finds out I've sent you, she'll be furious. Maybe she's gone on holiday. She would have told me. Maybe she forgot. No, she would have told me. Oh. When did Louise last call? She always called every Friday at 1 p.m. The last time she called was Friday the 26th of June. It must have been um, ooh, uh, 1 15 when she got through. She'd had problems getting change for the coin box. 1 15? Are you sure of that? What's wrong? Nothing. Perhaps I should try and track your daughter down, Mrs. Dearborn. <coughs> 
of a previous address. Mm, yes. She was living with Verity Bate, the daughter of a friend of mine. I'll get the address for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, Mrs. Foster? Have you seen a blue silk scarf about the place? I seem to have lost one. No, Mrs. Dearborn. Did he tell you where he was going? He just said to tell you that he was on to something, but he wanted to check it all out before telling you. Why do you keep asking anyway? Dora's told you that at least four times. I suppose Reg is really enjoying being a private detective, living out those Chandler-esque fantasies. Pounding the neon beat. Racking down the killer. Nothing to help him but his wits. Well, by tomorrow we'll be safely ensconced in the Cotswolds. So I really don't care what he does tonight. I suppose it is doing him good, even though he is driving me to distraction and seeing other women. Getting something decent to eat, that's all. But he didn't tell you where he was going. Will you stop interrogating Dora and eat your food? Somewhere You're lucky I agreed to talk to him at all. It's about Lou Sampson. I've thought and thought it has to be about him. What makes you so sure that it's about Lou Sampson? She would disappear. I'm afraid I haven't the faintest idea where she is. And I wouldn't tell you if I had. I suppose it's Mrs. Sampson tracking her down again. Or Mrs. Dearborn, I should say. About that woman, she never gives up. So you don't like Mrs. Dearborn? Put it like this. My mother did to me what she's done to me. I would never speak to her again. Oh, I'd like to hear about that. You do understand, don't you? That if I knew where you was, I wouldn't tell you. I don't know, but if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Oh, I appreciate that, Miss Bate, and uh, your principal do you credit. I'd rather die than help Mrs. Dearborn. Or him. Mr. Dearborn. <laughs> He was my dad's best friend. Nobody should speak to that man ever again. He's a prize shit of the first order. So you don't like him? I loathe him. And am I to understand that uh, Louise didn't like him either? Like him? You know nothing. She worshipped that man. She was so crazy about Stephen Dearborn, it isn't true. So she was in love with him? Of course she was. Shall I tell you the whole story? The unbiased account. There's no use you talking to Stephen Dearborn. You'll only say that he never thought of Lou in that way. And you must know he's a pathological liar. He lied to my dad about her. It's disgusting. Yes, well, the uh, unbiased account would be interesting to hear. Lou and I were at school together in Wimbledon. That's where my parents live. And Lou and Mrs. Sampson lived in the next street. Stephen Dearborn was living in ghastly Kemborn Vale. And Dad used to bring him home sometimes, on a 
out of him being what Dad called a poor, lonely widower. Oh, so he'd been married before. His wife died and their baby died. That was all centuries ago. Stephen was supposed to be fond of kids and used to take me out. Tower of London, changing of the guards, that sort of crap. And when I got friendly with Lou, he took us both. How old were you then? Fifteen, sixteen. I had to call him Uncle Steve. Makes me want to vomit just to think of it. Lou's not like me, you know. She keeps everything below the surface. But it's all there, emotion welling and churning like a cauldron. Anyway, one night when she was staying at my place, she told me that she was in love with Steve and that he loved her. I didn't know what to say at the time. I thought it was revolting, a girl of 16 falling for a man of 40. But it happens, you know. I suppose it does. I still think it's repulsive. What happened then? Then she asked him back to her place to meet her mother. Lou and I were about to sit our exams when Lou started not coming to school. I phoned her place and her mother said she wasn't well. Then one night my dad came in and said to Mummy, What do you think? Steve's going to marry the Sampson girl. <laughs> of course I thought he meant Lou. But he didn't. That's like calling a woman of 37 a girl. Lou never took her exams. She was really ill. She had a sort of nervous breakdown. I see, so it was a case of uh, Philia Bulkler made a book. If you say so. Anyway, they sent Lou to her grandmother's whilst they got married. I left school and started at drama college. And Daddy said he'd pay half the rent if I could find someone to share with. So when Lou rang from her grandmother's and said she never wanted to go back to her mother's, I suggested she stay with me. How long did that last? About a year. Lou was more shut in than ever. Her bloody mother used to phone and pretend to me it was all rubbish about Lou fancying Stephen. Anyway, Lou got fed up being hunted and went off to share with someone in Battersea. Lewis Adams, I think his name is. I'm not telling you the address, man. Oh, I wouldn't dream of asking you, Miss Bate. After that, we sort of lost touch. I suppose you couldn't stand to see someone suffering, was that it? Exactly. Louise Sampson went out of my life. Perhaps she's found happiness, perhaps not. I shall never know. Mr. Adams? Yes? Oh, I'm Detective Chief Inspector Wexford. I'm trying to locate the whereabouts <clears throat> of Miss Louise Sampson. I've been giving you your name, and I wonder if you can help. Nothing. Are you sure about that? You can just phone Oh, you mean Lulu? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We lived together for about four or five months. I don't know where she's now, though. Well, perhaps I can come and talk to you. Absolutely. Has anything happened to her? Yeah, yeah, I know, love. Yes, it's so well done. Yes. yes. Well, perhaps I could come and see you. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, what, tonight? About seven? Yeah. Do you know where I am? No. Uh, no, I don't. 20 Albert Gardens Terrace, Battersea. Thank you. I'll be there. Any joy? Check with every local registry office. Nothing. But there must be a hospital or a midwife that knows about it. You can't just have a baby and nobody knows anything about it. Can't you? I've heard stories here that would make that quite feasible. Have you? Yeah. You are here. Sorry. Um, have you got a moment? I thought you and Dora were moving on today. I'm nearly there, Mike. I'm a wrong hotel. Look, I don't know how much money this journey can take. Oh. OK. OK, we'll go. We don't know. I just need to know what you're up to. Oh, well, trying to help you. Oh, what have you found out? I just need to speak to one more person, Mike. Just give me an idea. Look, I want to make sure that I've got everything in place before presenting it to you. Then I'll hand it over to you and you can give it to Baker. Mike, please, trust me. OK. Baker has brought Gregson in. Why? Mrs Kirby. Uh, Gregson was repairing her TV on the 26th. Baker's got her to say that she received a phone call for Gregson from a woman at 1.15, and he's sure that it was Loveday. Why, that's impossible. 
Well, Baker's brought Gregson in. He's in the interview room. Well, you won't get anything out of him. Exactly. He's clammed up, and Baker wants you to have a go at him. Me? He thinks that Gregson will talk to you. Don't look at me like that. You wanted in on this. Well, you're in. And I'm in a corner. If you don't stay, I lose face with Baker. If you do, my love life goes down the drain. So please, come on. Lead on. I'll do whatever you want, Mike. This is a continuation of an interview with Brian Gregson. The interview was interrupted when Detective Inspector Baker was called away to deal with other matters. I am DCI Wexford, and the time is 10.15. So Harry Slade is providing your alibi. Everybody knows he provides alibis for villains. Can't you find somebody better to vouch for you? This uh, phone call that you received, Mrs. Kirby, who was it from? Come on. The sooner you answer these questions, the sooner you'll be out of here. Who called you that day? I let you into a secret. You want that? Inspector Baker here has a reputation of always being right. He thinks you're involved in this murder. I want to prove him wrong. So help me. It don't look like your mate's having any more luck than us. You still remain in sight, isn't it? Yeah, the old man's really trying. I can smell fear. And you smell so scared, boy. So scared. Now, who were you with that day? What's your relationship with Loveday Morgan? You didn't kill her. I know you didn't kill her. But your silence makes me think that maybe you did. Or you know who did. I got a level with you, boy. That phone call was from Loveday Morgan. We know that. We know that your alibi won't stand up in court. We know that there's something going on between you and her. Now, if you don't start telling the truth, we might have to charge you, and then you will have to talk. Now, you nod your head if you understand me. Now, did you answer my questions? Is it true that Loveday Morgan rang you at 1.15 on Friday the 26th of June? Oh, what a silly Sarah. He wants to see a solicitor. Oh, that's bloody marvellous. That's all I need. Well, we don't have enough to charge him. Somebody's been showing him the ropes. It certainly looks like that. Mr. Wexford, perhaps. Tell him his rights, no doubt. Yes? Inspector Wexford, we don't on the phone. Ah, oh, yes, right. Yeah, I'll let you in. Hang on. Hello, come in. I don't know what it is you want to know, so you better ask me questions. Yeah, have a seat. Oh, thank you. Don't mind if I eat? Uh, no. Where did you uh, meet Louise? came to a restaurant where I was working as a waiter. 
And we just started talking. She told me that she was sharing a flat in Earl's Court with a girl, and uh, she wasn't very comfortable because the girl's boyfriend was there all the time at nights and that. So I said, um, would she fancy coming sharing this place with me because the rent was a bit tough? Has she agreed? Yeah, she, um, yeah, she moved in that night, got her stuff and moved in. I mean, they were, you know, we were just sharing this place. There wasn't any, uh, like, you know, she had her life and I had mine. Oh, you were just flatmates? Yeah, that's the word, yeah, flatmates. Did she do any work? Yeah, a bit of cleaning, nothing much. She had some kind of allowance, I think. How did you get on with each other? Oh, fine, I liked her very much, yeah. She was uh, very quiet and shy and it was good, I liked that. You get sick of the sound and the fury. Her stepfather, he was, um, he was one for the sound and the fury. He came here? Mm. She'd been here about four months. And when she went to the door to let him in, she gave out this cry. Stephen, darling, Stephen, I knew you'd come for me one day. I mean, you know, I mean, it didn't sound like Louise on you. But he'd only come to find out where she was. How do you know that? Go on. Well, I didn't like him, right? And he didn't like me, and he came in, and he explained why he was there. And after he'd gone, Louise was really cut up. She said she felt rejected. I mean, they had a big row. Tell me about that. Why? How is that going to help you find her? Well, everything helps. Well, this stepfather, whatever his name is, was telling her how happy he and her mother were. When suddenly Lulu says, you're very fond of children, aren't you? And he said he was, and that he was hoping to have some. And she said, not with my mother, you won't. Don't tell me she forgot to tell you that she had a hysterectomy when I was 15. I mean, well, yeah, 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 I left the room. I didn't deal with that one. So they started screaming and shouting at each other, and uh, she didn't tell me what they said, but a week later, she left. Where did she go? Oh, I don't know. She didn't tell me. We weren't on very good terms when she left. I thought she behaved badly towards her stepfather, and she thought I was on his side, so... So you don't know where she went? No. A guy called John rings for her from time to time. I think he lives in Notting Hill. Maybe he's her boyfriend. Did he have a second name? John. Johnny. Dunno. <laughs> Oh, you're still here, then? We had to let Gregson go. His solicitor called that bluff. Where's Inspector Vernon? He was looking for you the last time he was in. Now he's out with Clemens, questioning the TV shop people. I was wondering if I could see all the possessions that were found on Loveday's body. I don't think that should do any harm. Oh, by the way, Ivan Thiel, the puffer at the top of Loveday's lodgings, wants to talk to you. Did he say what it was about? No, just that it was urgent. I should watch it if I were you. I think he fancies you. Thank you. I'll remember that. I was just joking. And don't call people puffers. It's offensive. So I don't understand them. Neither, I'm sure, did Hitler. Oh, these are the numbers you called. No letters, no address, no checkbook. She wouldn't have needed one, not earning what she did. And where's the baby's birth certificate? With Grandma Morgan, no doubt. And no doubt Grandma Morgan's as blind as a bat and deaf as a poster. She'd have come forward by now. Is anything else you want to see? Yes, the scarf she was killed with. Thank you. Who was supposed to be wearing this? The very one. Why? Doesn't it satisfy your morbid curiosity? This is an expensive scarf. Much more I would have thought than she could afford. Maybe it was a gift, or maybe she saved up a tenner and went with that. Women are like that, you know. Oh, this is not a ten-pound scarf. It's 
More like 60 quid. And it's blue. And as a matter of fact, I know someone who just lost a scarf like that. Aren't you coming to bed? No, I'll make it up for Mike. Can't whatever you have to tell him wait until the morning? No. You want us to move on, don't you? Well, of course. Mike, I want to talk to you. We must have talked to everyone connected to that TV shop at least four times. No one can give us a lead. Baker told me you were excited about something, but didn't want to tell him. I don't think he likes you. I don't like him either. Anyway, I wanted to tell you first. Life and those lips have long been parted. I wouldn't show that to her mother. We haven't found the mother to show it to. I have. And the murderer. Who? Stephen Dearborn. You're not serious. Listen, Stephen Dearborn is stepfather to Loveday Morgan, whose real name, I think, is Louise Sampson. Louise Sampson? Mrs. Dearborn used to be Mrs. Sampson. I was round at Dearborn's house the other night. They have a baby which is not theirs. It's adopted. I think it's Louise's. Why do you think that? Mrs. Dearborn had a hysterectomy six years ago. Louise was madly in love with Stephen Dearborn. I think he slept with her, but he married her mother. You can confirm all this? Most of it. Crocker said I could have one of those. Oh, yes, he did. Louise cut herself off completely. Eventually, she changed her identity. She became Loveday Morgan. Go on. However, she phoned her mother every Friday at one o'clock. Friday the 26th was the last call that Melanie Dearborn received from her daughter. And that was 15 minutes late, at 1.15, because Louise Loveday had trouble finding change for the phone box. Why didn't you come to me earlier? Because I wanted to get everything into place. I thought it might be a coincidence. Come on. Melanie Dearborn hasn't seen her daughter since Christmas. Plenty of time for Love Day to have her baby and give it to Stephen Dearborn, whom she loved so passionately. Then I think things went terribly wrong. He killed her and he put her into the tomb. Not born Properties are the trustees for that tomb. And Stephen Dearborn is chairman of Not born Properties. Exactly. And I have witnesses of rows between Stephen and Love Day. And there's more, much more. What? The scarf that she was killed with. I'm sure that it belongs to Melanie Dearborn. We ought to get Mrs. Dearborn in to identify the body. I think I want to be sure before we do that. How sure do you need to be? Well, I was contacted by Ivan Teal. He said he had something important. Ivan Teal? Yes. If he says it's important, it's important. Thank you. Thank you. You're too late. He's already gone. When will he be back? Well, he waited all day yesterday for you. Maybe you can tell us what he was calling about. I can't tell you anything. All I know is he was going through his cuttings and he suddenly said, oh, my God. Cuttings? What cuttings? Well, he's a designer. People write about him. 
Oh, well, can we go upstairs and have a look at this cutting book? I've got right now, sorry. Morning. All right for some. Nice to be a kept man. In it, Johnny. I'll look after her, don't I? I've done everything for her ever since she was born, haven't I? Except when you're down the pub. Oh, you go out every night leaving me stuck with her, don't you? And you lot, when are you going to open up Love Day's room so we can relet it? Landlords have lost 150. It's giving them sleepless nights. So someone wanted to rent it then? Yeah. I'll give you a number to ring. Oh, no, I'll give you the landlord's number. You can ring them. It was here somewhere. I thought you'd finished with it. We had. Well, you thinking of buying a house? <laughs> no, just dreaming, you know. Everybody dreams. You said you was going to chuck them out. Yes, I know. I don't clear up enough, do I, love? Here. They're there most of the time. Thank you. Hang on here. This better be good, Wexford. Perhaps we shouldn't all go in. I'll bring her out. No need to upset her any more than we have to. It's me. but I'm sorry to keep you waiting like this. I see you've brought reinforcements. I would have come quietly, you know. Uh, Mrs. Dearborn, I think we'd better... Sit down. Mr. Wexford, you can sit down for a moment, can't you? Oh. I, I don't think we'd better delay. The car's waiting. And... Well, we don't have to go anywhere. It's all right. My daughter rang me. She rang me about an hour ago. She's coming round. Oh, marvellous. As soon as I heard the pips, I knew it was her. Will you stay and see her? She's on her way. Oh, oh it's such a relief, I can't tell you. I'm so sorry you've had all that trouble for nothing. I was wrong. The daughter's coming home. With a few tales to tell, no doubt. Mr. Wixford, 
Perhaps next time you should ask to see a photograph of the missing person. <laughs> Give it a rest, Baker. Mistakes, Rach. Haven't you told me that before? I think I should go home. Oh, come on. You're helping us. No. It's madness. Last week, I thought I could jump in and sort out the baffling case that was eluding the lot of you. You'd all sit there and gasp in admiration as I expounded, like some elderly Lord Peter Wimsey. Well, I did. No. It was a mistake. Not to ask for a photograph. What was I thinking of? It was the excitement. Oh. That's no excuse. Baker never went along. Much as I dislike the man, probably right about Gregson. I shouldn't have interfered. I'm getting too old. Beg your pardon? Look, just take me home. I'll help Dora to pack, and we'll leave tomorrow. Evening, Vic. Evening, Mr. Baker. For a minute there, I thought you weren't going to let me in. You're always welcome here, Mr. Baker. You know that. I'm looking for one of your younger members by the name of Gregson. Is he in tonight? I don't know. I want to just come in. Well, why don't I go upstairs, have a drink, and see for myself? Feel free. Oh, Mr. Baker. No trouble, eh? My sentiments entirely. I like the artwork. What would you like, sir? No scotch. Fancy seeing you. Is English your first language, Gregson? Or are you just shy? What would you say if I was to tell you that your alibi is beginning to fall apart at the seams? On that cheap jacket you're wearing. Two men that were with you and Harry Slade, they talked. They say they never saw you after eight o'clock. But Harry Slade's girlfriend, well, it turns out she's got a record. So nobody believe her. I 
just thought you'd like to know this. Now, that leaves Harry Slade. And everybody knows what he does for a living. You should have chosen somebody more reliable. Although I doubt you know anybody who's really honest. Not even your mother. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get you another one. Was I right? No. He's bolted. Baker was having a go at him in a place called the Psychic Club when Gregson punched him and ran. Poor old Baker. Ah, oh, well, Gregson won't be hard to find. No, no, he'll be under lock and key by the morning. Oh, thanks, oh, Fred. Oh. Oh. oh, no. Well, well, at least the pot's not broken. Oh, the bloody pot. What about my foot? I think it's broken on my toes. It's just a pot, Mike. Here. I'm terribly sorry. Reg, leave it. Yeah, yeah, please, just just leave it. I'll do it. Um, just You just leave it. Um, you, you go to bed. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. You're not fit enough to lift heavy weights. No wonder you dropped it. I said I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just leave me alone. What's the matter with people when we get behind the wheel? Dora shouldn't have suggested you drive me in this morning. No, she was right. It was the least I could do. Just don't expect me to carry you up to your office. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm fine. You sure? I'm fine. I'm sorry. What are you sorry about? Nothing. Then don't be sorry. Sorry. Keep on trying for a slough, won't you? What's happened to you? I dropped a pot on his foot. It was an accident. Well, I can't imagine Mr. Wexford doing it on purpose, sir. I didn't expect to see you here today. I thought you were going back to your own manor. Well, I just popped in to say goodbye and wish you luck. Luck? With the adoption. Oh, well, uh, yeah, thanks. 
got a bit of a problem on our hands, sir. We've been trying to contact this man for the last two days. Um, have you tried the next-door neighbour? We tried the next-door neighbours. I haven't seen him neither. We went down to the shop, his place of work, and they're saying that he hasn't been over to him. You've been all right. I've survived. I hope so. I understand you're leaving this. Holiday over there? No. My wife and I are moving out to the Cotswolds today. Then you'll want to visit Billingsgate before you leave town. There's plenty of red herrings down there. And you'll find a wild goose to sniff it. for me. Wexford, Wexford. They said you weren't in. I don't want to speak to anyone else. I waited for you, but where were you? Mr. Teal, if you have any information, you better see Inspector Burden or Inspector Baker. But I want to see you. It's not my case anymore. In fact, it never was. You're the only policeman I know that also happens to be a human being. You listen to me. They just laugh. No. I think I have some very important information concerning Loveday Morgan. Mr. Teal, if you have anything to say, I suggest that you say it to Inspector Burden, and I assure you that he will listen. I know. There's a cafe just round the corner. Oh, very well. Do you usually come out just like that? No. I'm on my way to a wedding. That's if I don't die of lead poisoning first. The bride's gown is one of my own creations. She's a terrible woman. But what was so important that you had to stop here on the way? Well, that minister that we were talking about, do you remember? The children of Revelation. Do you remember? The minister from the church across the river who was sent to jail. It was in all the papers. Oh, yes. Yes, well, I found a piece about him on the back of one of my press cuttings. And? And it was a year ago last March. He was charged with bigamy, indecent assault on five women, oh, the courage the man must have had, and having had carnal knowledge of a 14-year-old. Now, I don't know what that means, but you probably do. Please come to the point, Mr. Deal. Of course, I know it's hindsight, but when I thought of Loveday's accent... Her accent? Yes, how she spoke. I mean, we all have an accent. I mean, mine's a ragtrag camp. Yours is like country bird, but Loveday Morgan spoke in a certain way. Well, what has this got to do with the minister of the uh, Church of the Revelation? Well, haven't you noticed how some people brought up in an enclosed community, such as an institution or a tight-knit church, have a special way of speaking? So? Well, that minister, his name, his name was Morgan. There. Now, I can go to my wedding. I hope that's been some help. Ooh, a moustache. Thank you, Mr. Tito. Oh. There's something I've got to finish off before we leave. But we leave this afternoon. What on earth is going on? There's just something I've got to do. What? What many detectives do. Well, what's that? Don't pry then.
don't get in there, mate. They never let no one in. Oh, why not, for God's sake? <laughs> yeah, that's right, for God's sake. It's irreligious to talk to the likes of you and me. Oh, don't they even open their doors? Oh, some of them do that, but you can't get inside. Well, can you tell me where the others live? Yeah, there's one lot of 94, that's around the corner there, and another lot of 56. Now, the 94 lot, they'll speak to you. I'll give them that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to disturb you. I wonder if you have time to talk. I'm writing a book on uh, religious sects. You want to know about the children of the Revelation? Uh, I 500 I... is our number. The number of the elect on the face of the earth. We make no converts. To be one of the children, you must be born to parents who are both children. And thus the number swells. And with death, decline. 500. Give or take a few. I wonder if we could talk in... I can't let you in. You should talk to the shepherd. He has a room in the house next to the temple. Uh, but they won't open the door to you. They've kept to a purer and straighter way than I. I'm married out. What about the people at number 50? Any luck? Oh, not really. What do you know about the people at 56? Well, Mrs Morgan's away. Her married daughter's ill. Oh, what about the other daughter? Well, she's got the daft work, I think. Saw her going out about ooh, half an hour back. Oh. Did you know Morgan before he went to jail? <laughs> I used to see him about. Did you ever see him about with a young woman? And... <laughs> Nobody knew what that man was up to. Yeah. Well, not till it all came out in the papers, that is. Anna Peters, well, girl who lives on Solomon Road, round the corner there, her dad saw one of Morgan's letters and blew the whole thing wide open. Oh. Anna Peters? Yeah, well, I ought to talk to her, then. Um, what number, Solomon Road? You work for a paper, then? Yeah, something like that. Sorry, have to work it out for yourself, then. I'm not in the business of scandal-mongering. They always send out the people your age to do their dirty work for them, don't they? Look after yourself, mate. No odd feelings, eh? Scotch water. Right. I'm looking for some people called Peters. Yeah. I think I've been given the wrong address. I've been given 34 Solomon Road. I don't think it's 34. <laughs> Might be 68. Yeah. I think the Peters live at 68. 68? Mm. Oh. Cheers, thank you. Cheers. I'm a police officer. I'm only speaking to you in the street because I didn't think I'd get admitted into your home. Miss Peters, I'm trying to find out about Loveday Morgan. She was killed a few weeks ago. No. I, I need to know about her. At first, I thought that she was one of Morgan's daughters, but now I realize that that is not the case, and that she was one of his wives, as you were. My father was going to turn me out after. Mother made him let me stay. Could she be married to the same Morgan that you were with? 
I never heard of a girl called Love Day. Love Day was not a real name. I have to know what happened to his wives. I mean, did any of them leave the community in the last 12 months? Did they go away? They all went away, except me. Mary went away to be a teacher. Sarah went, and Rachel. Rachel was the youngest, wasn't she? Now, where did she go? I don't know. My father will punish me. Who can I talk to? Who would know? No one. Please. Talk to the shepherd. Well, he won't even open his door. You have to talk to him. Now leave me alone! I'm sorry to disturb you. We're making inquiries. Oh, a policeman. Do come in. I was just going to make a cup of tea. Now, would you like one? My husband was in the force. You all have heard of him. Wally Lyle? Well, I'm afraid I'm a stranger in these parts, Mrs. Lyle. I, I won't keep you. I wonder if you could tell me the name of the people next door. On my left or my right, young man? Oh, of course. On uh, your right. Vickers. But she won't get in there. Oh, she don't let no one in there except the electric meter man. Yeah, you might as well have that cup of tea. I know what it's like when you're on the beat all day. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. No. Wally tried to get a doctor into that house next door. Oh, they wouldn't have it. That was when Rebecca was sick with the scarlet fever. They don't believe in doctors, those revelationers. They'd see their kids dying before they'd have a doctor. Did he succeed? <laughs> Not likely, no. He banged and banged on the door. An old vicar's come out, and old vicar's cursed him. It made your blood run cold to hear him. No, my husband said he'd have nothing to do with them after that, and he never did. And that was the only contact that you had with them? What I did. What did you do? Well, there's no harm in telling you after all these years. You see, Rebecca, she wanted to get married to a young fella she met called Foster. But he wasn't one of them. And her daddy put his foot down. He kept her shut up in the house, a prisoner in her in, in bedroom. She used to write little notes and throw them down to me out of the window. <laughs> of course, I could see in them days. Well... I was all for putting a spoke in the wheel of those revelationers. So I had young Foster in here jollying him along. And then one day, when they were all in church, we got a ladder and we put it up outside her window. <laughs> and down she came, just like a play it was. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet? Yes, yes, that's the one. Oh, I've often had a laugh about that. <laughs> well, that's quite a story. Well, old Vickers died and his son took over the place. He had two children, 
Matthew and Rachel. Rachel? Of course, they've grown up and moved on. <laughs> I didn't help none of them escape. Rachel Vickers? No, it's just Vickers and his wife that run the church now. Did Rebecca marry Foster? Oh, yes, she did. She became Mrs. Foster. Yes. Bit of luck for her, that was, catching him like that, because she wasn't much to look at. She had uh, this great big mole on the side of her face. A mole? Yes, between her nose and her cheek. Of course, she could have had it seen to, but like I said, those revelationists don't believe in doctors. Where did she go? To Fulham. Yes, I've got a letter somewhere. But you'll have to look for them yourself. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. What's that? <laughs> Rebecca won't get you into that house next door. <laughs> Take one of them cruise missiles to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to read those letters. So would I. She doesn't know I'm blind. <laughs> so would I. Come with me. I don't know exactly where they are. But I'll help you look. One for every year, right back to the wedding. Oh, I can't read them anymore, but I can feel them. <laughs> you mustn't be afraid, Mr. Wexford. Pardon? Growing old isn't such a terrible thing. As you grow older, your memories get younger. Why, only last night, I dreamt I was being thrown up in the air by my mum and dad. Up in the sky, so high against the blue, I was flying. <laughs> I was so happy. So don't be afraid. You're younger than you know. Oh, I think these are from Rebecca. Thirty-six, Beretta Street, Fulham, SW6. I would ask you to read them to me, but I feel you want to move on and you think you're running out of time. So hurry up, Mr. Wexford. Thank you, Mrs. Lyle. <laughs> Thank you. What did you say? Uh, Beretta Street. 36 Beretta Street. It's a corner shop. Police officer, I'd like to talk to you. What about? Your niece, Rachel Dickers. Let's talk out the back. Come this way. Thank you. Wendy, look after things for a moment. I've been talking to Mrs. Lyle. Mrs. Lyle? Does she still live down there, next to my brother? She's blind now. The only thing she knew was your address. Blind? 
blind. And I'm a widow. And, and Rachel... <laughs> Here, no, sit, sit down. <laughs> the world, it, it, it's all wrong, so it should be done. Maybe. I want you to tell me about Rachel Vickers. I promised her. Your promise is of no use to her now, Mrs. Foster. She's dead. Dead? How dead? You know she's dead. I came round here and showed you her photograph. You recognize the girl. Now, you know what happened, don't you? Yes. And why did you lie to me? Tell me the whole story. She came to my house in July, last July. My brother turned her up when he knew she was expecting. She was so small. She never ate, and she hardly showed till the end. He told her to get out. She came to me because there was no one else. She knew nothing of the world. I'd have thought she was simple if I hadn't been like that once myself. The baby. Well, of course, she, she hadn't seen a doctor, not anyone. She wouldn't see one when she came here. I have this job and I also do cleaning. I came back from work one day and she'd had the baby all by herself in my bedroom. By herself? I made her see a doctor then. I sent for my own. He was angry, but what could I do? He sent the midwife in every day. And I had it registered in Chelsea, up the King's Road, in the name of Vickers. And Morgan was the father? Yes. She said she was his wife, and that when he got out of prison, they'd be married properly. But I knew that was impossible. We looked after it between us, but it was no good. What happened? I had it adopted. Rachel loved it, but she agreed. It was impossible for both of us, and being without it, got her down. So she left and found a room and I never heard from her again. Not until you, until. Who adopted it? I can't tell you who adopted it. I know, but I can't tell you. I couldn't even tell Rachel. They didn't want her to know. York Minster Hotel. Mr. Dearborn, yes. I'll see if he's in his room, Mrs. Dearborn. Just hold. Got it. Sorry. Right. There's only a the development behind. Mr. Dearborn, I know. there's yes. a call for you. It's your wife. She says it's rather urgent. Where can I take it? If you'd like to follow me. Checking up on you, Mr. Dearborn. It may be Alexandra. She's teething. <laughs> you can take it through there, sir. Thank you. Melanie? They know. Who knows? The police. And not works for other police. Inspector Baker. He took me in to identify a scarf today. A scarf that was used to strangle that girl. It was my scarf, Stephen. It was my scarf. I know. How did she get it? Oh, I must have given it to someone. I don't know. The cleaner. Maybe she lost it. We must tell them. Tell them the truth. Yes, of course. Stephen? Alexandra is the murdered girl's child. Yes, I know. They've suspended the adoption hearing. We're going to lose Alexandra unless you get down here and explain it to them. Come home, Stephen. Please come home. Be all right. It's just a confusion. 
Just remember that I love you and I love Alexandra. Remember that, will you? Just come home. I love you both. Just a few points, things I've been going over. Probably the same as ours. Uh, Baker and I brought in Mrs. Dearborn today to identify that scarf. And what we want now is a little help from you. Uh, wait for me, Mike. I'll be over. What, now? I'll get a taxi. But, um... Just wait for me. Not going out again. Oh, Dora. <laughs> What's this? You're younger than you know. Now, where's my hat? Welcome to Casualty. I wasn't going to say anything. You don't have to. Burden here has been inflicting me with your woes and a misguided attempt to make me into a nice person. That's impossible. That's what I told him. I will never be nice. But I will apologise to you, Chief Inspector Wexford. You were right about Gregson not killing the girl, but I was right about his guilt. We picked him up and his alibi fell to pieces. He and his mates were out housebreaking that night, as they have been every Friday night. The girl who found him when he was fixing Mrs. Kirby's TV set was Harry Slade's girlfriend. She was setting up the robberies. Well, it's no wonder he wasn't very talkative. So I followed up your lead about the scarf. And everything's coming together. We just wanted to bounce a few things off you. Like who killed Rachel Vickers? You crafty bugger. So that's where you've been all day. Maybe it's as far down the line as we are. How did you find out? Melanie Dearborn. She was very frank, very open. When she realised the importance of the investigation, she told us quite freely that Alexandra is a baby that she and her husband are adopting privately. Two adoption societies had already turned them down on account of their age. So when the opportunity arose just before Easter to take this baby, they jumped at it. Dearborn intended to adopt, legally, and through the proper channels. So when the child came along, he notified the children's departments and the courts of his intention to adopt. And a guardian at Lighton was appointed. You make it sound so cold. Dearborn loves that child passionately. Yes, well, I don't think we should let our emotions get involved. Naturally, the old thing's pretty painful. Carry on. Thank you. 
Mrs. Dearborn had never met Rachel Vickers. All she knew about her came from the girl's auntie, a cleaner. Mrs. Foster, yes, I spoke. And to the guardian at Lytham. The girl with the gloves. You want to carry on for me? No. They all knew her as Rachel Vickers, never as Loveday Morgan. And on June the 14th, Dearborn came back after taking the child out and said he'd met Rachel Vickers. She recognised the child with him coming out of a shop. Rachel asked if she might see the baby again, and Dearborn agreed, although reluctantly, giving her his office phone number. As far as Mrs Dearborn knows, the girl showed no interest in the child after that. We know, however, that Loveday had an interview with Dearborn in his office. And I think we can conclude that that interview had nothing to do with the job application. This is where we want to hear your point of view. Dearborn wanted to keep that child just as intensely as Rachel wanted her back. At the interview in that office that afternoon, she told him that she would oppose his order being granted. And then Dearborn took the highly illegal step of offering her £50,000 not to oppose it. How can you possibly know that? Well, Sergeant Clements contemplated paying money to make sure of adopting his child. Of course. And then Rachel told Johnny. Oh, wait, wait. You just let me get on with my idea of what happened next. The floor is yours. Rachel agreed to take the money. The way you get 50,000 from, I don't know. Mike, do you remember those estate agent papers? Please, would you just let me finish? Hmm? Rachel agreed to take the money, and she promised to phone Dearborn to fix a date for that transaction. Now, the date she chose was June the 26th. She phoned Dearborn from Garmish Terrace on that day at 1.15. And an hour later, they met in the cemetery. Mrs Dearborn has told us that she often wore her husband's sheepskin jacket and probably put the scarf in that jacket pocket. I think he met the girl as arranged. But as he was about to part with the money, he thought how much safer and easier it would be to kill the girl and keep the money. Murder being once done, he is in less fear. Very likely. Killing Rachel was the only way he could make sure that she would not come back for the child later or at any other time. He had no alternative. So he strangled her with a silk scarf and put her body in the Montfort tomb. Have you charged him? No. He's away in Yorkshire Architects Conference. But his wife will get a touch with him. Well, so what? He's back tomorrow. Let him stew. And if he tries to do a runner, then we'll know he's guilty. Mrs Dearborn doesn't know that we suspect him. Yeah, but she does know she doesn't stand a chance in hell of adopting that child now. Do you want my advice, Baker? You get on to Dearborn's hotel now. Why? Just do it. Mr Dearborn? Call an ambulance, quickly. Yes. You call a doctor? Local police? Oh, I don't see. There was a doctor staying in Dearborn's hotel. He's with him now. He tried to kill himself? Yes. They're pumping him out. It sounds critical. Some sort of overdose. Oh, well. Perhaps it's all for the best. Come on, Burton. Well, it's better than years inside, isn't it? In this position, I might have taken the same way out. What position? I pick up Melanie Dearborn. I need to talk to her. What position? You don't still think that he did it, do you? Don't you? Reg? Baker! What are you going to prosecute him for? Making a present of money to a poverty-stricken girl, his cleaner's niece, and then withdrawing the offer at the last minute? Dearborn killed her. The scarf belonged to his wife in the pocket of the coat they both wore. No! Wrong! Mrs Foster took that scarf, and Loveday took it from her. She was wearing it anyway. He had abundant motive, which no one else had. He also had the special knowledge. He put her in that tomb, like you said, so she wouldn't be found until after he had his adoption order. He knew that that tomb would be checked at the end of the month. His special knowledge would have made him hide her somewhere else. I'm bringing in Melanie Dearborn and we'll see who's right. Now, come on, Burden. I'll be downstairs in the car. Mike, 
Don't you remember those estate agent's details that we saw in Peggy's flat? The last time we were there, remember? Now, who knew Loveday best? Who talked to her most? Who have we all overlooked? Who might have known what happened and put the fear of God into Dearborn? Now, we shouldn't be here, Mike. Come on. We should be in Garmish Terrace. What's up? Nothing, Johnny. Go back to sleep. What's she doing? I can't stand it, Johnny. I don't care about the new house. I'm going. No, you're not. Get away from me! <laughs> you, get out of here. Get out of here! Johnny! After what I've done for you. I think Mr. Burden ought to be here. Would you mind going back and giving him a hand? But, sir, I'll uh, just... Thank you. Thank you. Right, sir. Johnny, I know what happened. It's best if you came quietly. Give me the child, Johnny. This is no place for a baby. Come on, lad.
We'll look after it. Just give it to me. And then we can talk. Why did you kill her? We needed the money. We had to have somewhere to live where she could have a garden to play in. Tell me what happened. There was this woman. Girl, really. She'd had a baby and she'd given it away. But now she wanted her baby back. But they'd offered her money if they could keep the baby. A lot of money, 50,000 pounds. Well, she, uh, she liked me. She said we could all live together in a house, so I started looking for a house. But she was stupid. She, she was so st stupid. She told you everything, didn't she? Yeah. She even rang me to tell me she was meeting him here to get the money. She called you at the pub, where you used to take all your calls. That's right, business. Well, I watched him meet, and I, I thought he'd given her the money. Then he went away, and I asked her for the money, and she said she didn't have it. <laughs> Stupid bitch. She thought that he'd give her the money and let her keep the baby. Go on. Well, I thought she was messing me about. Messing my baby about. I got angry. I was sure she had the money. I, I, I got angry. I got too angry. I can still smell her. Does she have the money? No. But I managed to scare that bastard into giving me some, keep my mouth shut. It was all for my baby. It was all for my baby. Thank you, Reg. No, I want to thank you for believing in me. I believed you because you were right. I'm looking forward to getting back to King's Markham. Me too. <laughs>